cosa che non vorrei, un luogo a cui tieni, una cosa che non vorresti perdere. Mm. Un, è, com'è un ricordo? A memory. A memory, a memory that you don't... Okay. And so yeah. Cosa c'è? C'è il ballo. Ci mettiamo qui? Se questi li messi per il pubblico, voi disponetevi pure al centro se... Oh, no. Aggiungete, via. Yeah. Okay. Eh, Roberto arriverà. Sì, buona notte. Gli arriverà. Ok, vai. Ok, pronti? Um, oh, thank you, David. We can start with some general questions. I'd like to ask you something just to start about the contemporary financial and economic crisis. Whether uh, is there anything new, anything crucial at stake here? Anything that you see as symptomatic of a general reorganization of capital and social relations? I think the, uh, the move to financialization, which has occurred over the last 30 or 40 years within uh, capital, represents a move into that form of capital that can grow without limit. Mm. And I think this is a very significant move because Capital is, I think, uh, encountering limits in its other forms of production, uh, consumption, and I think is having a hard time keeping growth going. Uh, but it's easy to grow when uh, you're just dealing with money power because uh, the central banks and the banking system can just create as much money as they want. So, in a way, Capital has liberated itself from a, a lot of material, physical constraints in the world by switching into the financial form. The difficulty, of course, is finding out what that financial form might actually mean. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of questions about what is money, where does it come from, how come it is getting created in this kind of way, what does it mean that uh, the Federal Reserve and just drop an extra billion dollars of cash into the economy when it feels like it. Um, what does this do to our understanding of how an economy works? Focus a little bit on, um, on the narrative of uh, liberal and neoliberal discourses. Yes. Uh, many accounts in the recent uh, two decades have emphasized how <coughs> neoliberalism in a way foster a full uh, enjoyment, a full consumption, a full plenitude and uh, this Zizek, for instance, emphasizes the Lacanian motive of the injunction to enjoy. But uh, what is going on over the last uh, two or three years is rather a discursive uh, emphasis over austerity, sacrifice and limit. We are now moving towards uh, a different paradigm in the public discourse. And I wonder whether this is indicative somehow of a reorganization of neoliberal discourse. Uh, to me, uh, the neoliberalism all along was a class project mm. to accumulate much more power and much more wealth in a smaller and smaller group in the population. And I think one of the most significant indices which uh, I would look at in the history of neoliberalism is the measure of inequality. Mm. And inequality has grown enormously Uh, the rich have grown, grown immensely richer, whereas the mass of the population has not really improved its living standards and hasn't been able mm. to enjoy mm. all mm. of its consumption. Now, of course, the rich and the close to the rich uh, are engaging in conspicuous consumption, which is the sort of thing we notice in the center of cities uh, like Rome or Manhattan, or you know, in the center of conspicuous consumption. Uh, but for the mass of the population, Uh, we have about a fifth of the population in the United States, for example, that is living in poverty. Mm. And they are not enjoying consumption at all. But do you think they might be any way trapped into this dynamic of desire? I don't think this is anything about uh, desire. I think this is about basic human needs. And a lot of basic human needs are not being met in the world right now. But at this very same moment as immense wealth is being accumulated by this very small group the famous 1%, or I think it's more like the, the, the top 10%, which is, in, which is living in that world of, of conspicuous consumption and mobilization of desire, and the 90% is, is living under conditions which are not of that sort. So the, the project, neoliberalism as a project, is still pretty much effective? Oh, it's extremely effective. If you look at the crisis since 2008, 
the mass of the population that was most affected has not uh, has not uh, improved its living standard at all. Uh, what we see, however, is the top one percent or the top ten percent has actually regained almost everything it lost in two thousand and eight, and in some respects they are much better off now than they were just four or five years ago. So I would argue that the uh, ultra rich have actually benefited from the crisis considerably mm -hmm. and uh, have not uh, lost. So again, to the degree that there was a neoliberal project from the very beginning, which was about the accumulation of much more wealth and power in a small oligarchy, uh, that project is alive and well and has not been affected by the crisis. In fact, uh, it's been deepened by the crisis rather than being disrupted by the crisis. Most of accounts uh, over the last uh, really three, four years have been emphasizing the way debt is assumed or is, is going to be used as a sort of dispositive yeah. of uh, biopower and uh, producing the subjugation, uh, mutual uh, and generalized blackmailing and um, dependency and the traits, the features of, the, of how that is function as a dispositive are located in its uh, permanency, its perpetuation, its lack of limit. And, um, but I wonder whether you agree with this kind of uh, picture which emphasizes the novelty of that. I think there's, there's a deep continuity uh, between what is happening right now and what has been happening over the last 40 years of the, if you like, the unfolding of the neoliberal project, which has gone at a different speed in different places in different times. I think all along uh, what we have been uh, forced to adjust to is uh, a regime of austerity for the masses. And that has been true since the 1970s uh, with the breaking of uh, trade union power uh, the breaking of traditional uh, working class organizations in, in our part of the world, in Europe and, and North America. And with the, the breaking of that power base of working class movements, so in effect we've been told that we have to adjust to this, this new world of heightened competition. And of course the word globalization is used when you know, working class people say we well, need more money. Uh, the answer is uh, you can't get more money because globalization won't let you. Mm. And we have to be competitive with China, and we have to be competitive with S Southeast Asia and Mexico and all the rest of it. So uh, I think the, 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 that project uh, has continued. And so the present bout of austerity politics, which is being administered throughout Europe and North America and to some extent in Japan, that that... Uh, that, that, that move into austerity politics is not new. Uh, it's a deepening of what was going on and has been going on for the last 30, 40 years. And we have a very curious situation right now where one half of the world, uh, led by China, has been growing very fast, even in the midst of this depression. And they've been doing it with, in a way, what is called a typical Keynesian strategy. They've seen a crisis and their response to it is build, make things, expand the economy, go into debt. And of course, China has surpluses, a lot of surpluses. So going into debt is not a problem. It can just use its surpluses yeah. to cover its debt. So the Chinese have been building cities, been building new rail systems, have been building new dams, a huge kind of infrastructure project. And, and of course, uh, they've been growing uh, really quite fast. Uh, the response to the crisis uh, in Europe and North America has been exactly the opposite. It says the proper response to the crisis is more austerity. Now, that's not economic ne economically necessary. Mm. In fact, economically, it does not make sense. And I think more and more people are beginning to say, economically, this does not make sense. Uh, we have uh, people like Paul Krugman, we have Stieglitz, we have some of the top economists now in the United States saying, this austerity just does not make sense. Mm. Uh, but it, it does make sense when you see the austerity as being a political thing. Okay. And the political thing is to take a vulnerable population, i.e. the mass of the population, squeeze them even harder, suppress them even more, get even more wealth mm. uh, up mm. into the very upper, upper classes. And, and that seems to me what the, this crisis 
has been turned into, all right, now we can cut all of the state expenditures. We can cut all of the social programs for working people. the labor people. market. Yeah, and, and destroy, right. dis yes, destroy the labor market even more than it's been destroyed, you know, 20 years, uh, 20, 30 years, over the last 20 or 30 years. So when I say that this is a deepening of that project and a continuation of that project, I think uh, if you see it in class terms and see it as a class project, it, it becomes very clear w what has been happening and why we've turned to austerity politics in this part of the world rather than doing what the Chinese have done, which is to go for an expansion, uh, which could then have the possibility of actually redistributing some wealth uh, away from the very rich to the mass of the population. Uh, just a curiosity, uh, considering what you are saying uh, and considering the last 10 years, do you see any, any link between uh, politics of war and... Uh, and uh, this deployment of austerity and precarity just to create a dependency. I mean, the war on terror, we now accept what was unacceptable only 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Now the crisis has been used to accept Absolutely. the unacceptable. Absolutely. Is I say, the same strategy going on Absolutely. Here? I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, the situation economically, the rich are growing very much richer, uh, the poor are growing relatively poorer, uh, state uh, uh, s services to the mass of the population are being systematically reduced. You would look at this and you would say, this is, a, this is an economic situation which should be responded to by a mass uprising mm -hmm. of the mass of the population. So there's a big problem mm -hmm. for the very wealthy, which is how to institute a form of autocratic government which actually forecloses on the possibility of some mass, mass uprising. The war on terror was a fantastic, again, you don't let something like that go to waste, and this then proved the, if you like, a, a, the possibility of, of instituting uh, the equivalent of a, of a police state uh, on top of the austerity. So we have uh, a government which is dedicated to austerity, uh, but at the same time, it's also becoming far, far more militarized. And, and, and the question of security is being used uh, to secure populations against uh, any, any mass movement which looks like it's going to challenge existing political power. We'll, we'll all be defined as terrorists. Yeah. Simply yeah. that. You know. Do you see um, a way out? Uh... I, I travel the world a lot, and there's no place I've been where there hasn't been some movements going on which are, you know, rebelling, if you like, against the situation. In some places they're very small, they're usually fragmented. Uh, it's very difficult to get, you know, to, to, for them to come together. But I think if you, if you took a global vote right now and said, is this the kind of world you want to live in? I think the answer would be a resounding no. We want to live in something very, very different, something that's more socially just. Mm. And, and so uh, I think the possibility exists for a mass movement. At the moment, what we see instead are these outbreaks of, of, of sometimes violent rebellion. You, you, you know, I, I mean, what happened in, in Istanbul recently? Mm. What happened in Stockholm? What happened just recently in Brazil? Uh, and if you, you just go back and you see some part of the world is erupting. You know, it was mm. London two or three summers mm. ago. Uh, then it's then it's somewhere else, and you don't know where it's going to be next. Uh, it, it would not surprise me if I open the newspaper tomorrow and there's an uprising somewhere. But the uprising is usually short-lived. Uh, it's usually not got a very well-defined political aim. Um, the Jacquerie yes, in the uh, historical yeah, sense. Yeah, it's, yes, it, it, it is. It is a, a, a bit like that. But yeah. then you then you look at the situation and say, <clears throat> it's a bit like. Um, there's a volcanic magma underneath of discontent, mm. and it pops up here, and this volcano explodes mm. there. And at some point or other, you think to yourself, there may be a mass movement at some point, which can, very, can, can, can coalesce and say, enough is enough, we've had enough of this, and it's time we had actually engaged in very radical change. And I, I don't think it's impossible to imagine. Um, some of the changes that have occurred over the last 30 or 40 years have been very surprising. I mean, nobody anticipated the collapse of the Soviet Union, yeah. and yet, bang, mm -hmm. happened overnight. Capital is in a very fragile state right now. We saw in 2008 how dangerously close it is to some edge, mm -hmm. and if it falls over, uh, 
we, we could see mass changes very, very quickly. Just the last question, so regards to Europe, what do you think Europe should learn, uh, could learn from other experiences in South America yesterday? You were pointing to South America or other contexts, not Africa. Well, the, the, most governments in, in Latin America are, they're not anti-capitalist, but they're anti-neoliberal. Mm. And they've tended to go against this general project I'm talking about, the accumulation of more and more class power. They tended to be more redistributive. And as a result, you see that uh, Latin America is, uh, has, has been growing some uh, in ways that is not true for Europe. And so that the point of public policy and, and, and in terms of uh, political project, I think that uh, Europe could, could use a dose of Latin Americanization. The other thing that we're seeing, of course, is uh, the emergence of all sorts of political movements in Latin America. Uh, in mon some instances based on indigenous populations and they're philosophically uh, moving in a, in, a, in a rather different kind of way. So if you look at the constitution uh, of uh, countries like Bolivia and Ecuador, you start to see a rather different mm -hmm. sentiment, set of sentiments about how the world should be. So it's, and it's much more about the well-being of the masses of the population and less and less about uh, the concentration of wealth in the, in the oligarchy. So I'm not arguing that this, anything is perfect in Latin America, but I'm saying that, that the movement, the direction of Latin America could easily be followed by Europe, and I think things would get very much more interesting and better here if that, if that happened. David, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.